With a legacy of timeless hits and a voice that shaped the soundtrack of an era, Bjorn Alvaeus from the iconic band ABBA needs little introduction. As one-fourth of the Swedish supergroup, his contributions to music have transcended borders and generations. In my interview, we discussed not only the process of writing and recording with ABBA, but also his recent experiences with AI technologies. Here's my interview. Bjorn, welcome. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask you about ABBA, but I want to talk to you about AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, we start there. What are your thoughts on where we are now and where things are going with AI? Well, I had an AI model demonstrated to me a couple of weeks ago by one of the really big tech companies. Okay. I, I was blown away uh, uh, about the potential. What, what they showed me was mind-boggling. Okay. And what you've heard so far is, is nothing against what's coming. Okay. And I'm getting um, nervous. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, th th you you have to be defensive and offensive at the same time as as a creator because it's a fantastic tool. Mm -hmm. It will be the most fantastic co-writer you would ever have. But on the other hand, uh, these AI models will be training on music that people have written. Right. I don't know it if it's too late, but but certainly we have to fight for the writers of that music so that they can get remunerated in some form or other. I don't know if they'll be able to opt out if they don't want to be trained on. Uh, but I suspect that that's going to be very difficult to prove whether a model is trained on, on, on ABBA music or not. Because from what I heard coming out, from that demonstration was that the melody, if you, if you ask it to write an ABBA-like melody, mm -hmm. you would never be able to recognize that. You'd, you'd, you'd never be able to hear that it comes from Benny and me, if it's sung by someone else, right? which in this case it was. And, and, and then it's, so, so it, it, it'll be so difficult to trace and to track. Hopefully, um, these big companies will be good guys, and and I, I think some of them want to be on the side of the creators, okay, rather well, than against. Right now, the things that are popping up, at least on YouTube, things I've talked about, there's uh, people taking young Mac Paul McCartney, mm. training his vo voice using Beatles mm. multi tracks, voices, right? voices, yeah. That, that, that's this one is thing. one part of it, yeah. right? And then taking a, a song that Paul McCartney, this is a thing that I talked about in a video, took a song that Paul did when he was 71, but put young Paul McCartney's voice on it. Yeah. Okay. The people that are doing the demonstration for you, are they saying, have you, did you talk about how do people get credited? As we did. Okay. And That's what exactly do they say? what they wanted to talk about. Okay. This is what's happening right now. We have to find a way. But nobody's claiming yet that we know exactly where to go. Because as I said, it's very, very, very difficult to say what it has been trained on, unless you, what, what you described, which is much, much easier, um, because that is a voice that you recognize. Right. The style of recording, the style of writing melodies, not necessarily easy mm -hmm. to detect. Right. But the prompt, the instruction to the AI model, that's where you could go. And if there's someone in the prompt, like ABBA-like, but with a hint of Queen, sung by Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but then you can act at least, you know, identify who, who, it's been, uh, who it's been trained on. But how do you then distribute whatever payment comes out of that? This is a huge problem for the music industry and one that is being talked about, you know, as we speak around the globe. I have a theory you're going to have on platforms like Spotify, ABBA and ABBA AI, the Beatles, Beatles AI, Elton John and Elton John AI yeah. eventually. And people, I think, will accept those things. Do you think that the artists will accept themselves that there's an AI version of their music? I, I don't know, because I haven't been exposed to it. You know, it might be good. It, it might be that these uh, AI songs point back to the, the original mm -hmm. and, and may make the original stream better, perhaps. Right. We don't know that. As I said, 
it, it, uh, at, at the same time, it's a fantastic tool. Mm -hmm. Let's say I want to write something for a musical, and it needs to be a tango. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I ask the AI model to g give me a, a, a suggestion based on the 10 best tangos in ever written. And it comes up with ideas. And I will say, oh, that's not bad. I'll keep that. Right. But then I'll tweak it. And I'll do something myself. And I might ask for a lyric idea, you know. I, I will use it as a tool, like, mm -hmm. like a synth or like anything you use in songwriting. So that's exciting mm -hmm. to me as, as a creator. I've heard from friends that are in Nashville that in all these writing sessions that the Nashville writers are doing that they use chat GPT. Now. Yeah, you do already, yeah. Yeah. Is there something that needs to be embedded in these things that will enable you to know how these models are trained? As far as I know, um, after the event, it's very hard to trace. Okay. So it needs to be transparent from the beginning, or the prompt, the instruction, what that contains. Otherwise, I only see like a blanket license for... Um, the uh, a label and a publisher and the CMO gives a DSP a blanket license or, or an AI model a blanket license to use its catalog and then pays a fee for that, which is then distributed in in some way to the creators. It's very complicated, but and who uh, figures uh, this out? Because these are these yeah, are this laws is being figured out right now as yeah. we speak. Yeah, and nobody's you know, agree to what it, what, where it will end yet. We're having this discussion while so many other discussions are going on. Did you ever think, could you ever have imagined a world like this when you were making records back in 1975, 1976? No, I mean, that was even before the first synth, the first move, mini move. Yeah. When we did Mamma Mia, yeah. the song, Mm -hmm. that the the synths hadn't come onto the stage yet uh the the desk wasn't computerized we had 16 or or eight i can't remember now mm -hmm. but there, there were three of us sitting in front of the desk like this a um, um, military like like <laughs> exercise would you I, I had the i had the responsibility for the right side and benny the middle and and our sound engineer the left and and we did that over and over again until everything was, you know, we thought perfect. Would you mix sections and then edit the, splice the... Uh... No, we would mix the whole thing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so there was an echo up that place and then back, you know, stuff Okay, like how that. many pa passes would it take to get a mix sometimes? What would be a lot? Would you get it sometimes 10 times, sometimes one time? If if we really were convinced that now it's, it's finished, it's time to mix. Yeah. Maybe 10 times, sometimes more. So things were so much easier in a way. Yeah. We were, you know, sometimes very lucky to end up with a mix like Mamma Mia, which is so incredibly good even today. Yes. There's nothing there that I think, oh, that bass should have been slightly louder. There's nothing, which is not the case uh, for some songs that I won't mention. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it get to a point, though, where there's things about it where you're like, I can't remember what I used to hate about the mix or whatever, right? There must be some things like that. I remember that I... I, w I would think, oh, we should have, that hi-hat is a bit, slightly bit too loud. But then the record came out and you forgot. Right. So it wasn't that important after all. And now let's say you have, have ideas and you maybe abandon something, but you know it has, this is a good verse, or this may be a good bridge or something. Yeah. Were you the guy that would say, hey, I remember this this thing that we did three weeks ago, and yeah. there's, there's a bridge here that I think would fit with this other song? We both did that. Okay. You and, and Benny and both would do yeah, that. Yeah, yes. We, we never put anything on tape. Okay. And we never wrote anything down. Okay. How did you remember it, it, things? It was only the, the, the stuff that really stuck, you know, okay. that, that we've ever used. There's several bridges and several verses, you know, like around in, in, in our HI model, <laughs> human intelligence model. <laughs> right. Something would come up and one of us would, you know, click and say, hey, 
you know, remember that one? And then sometimes beautifully it would just integrate with the other bit. Would you refer to sections? Like how would you, would you call verse, verse B part, pre-chorus? Would you use terms like that to refer to your songs? I would use terms like intro, instrumental, uh, verse, bridge, chorus. Uh, every ingredient, e everything had to be the best it could be. So there was no having a great chorus, so it doesn't matter about the verse. Let's, let's take that verse because the chorus is so good. It was never like that. It was always a matter of, you know, never finishing anything unless every part was there. And of course, when we went into the studio, sometimes every part wasn't there, but almost all of it. Uh, some some stuff would come up in the studio, of course. But the song proper, we would have written before we went into the studio. When you wrote them, you'd be playing guitar, or having piano. And yeah. It's something, it, the songs would be written around something, yeah. right? And then you guys would rehearse them, and you kind of know what the structure is, and then you go in and you start tracking the song. I, I wouldn't say that we knew always what the character of the song was. We just had the song and the chords. Yeah. And and then sometimes a song would, you know, change and mm -hmm. become something else than, than we had ever anticipated. Like Dancing Dancing you, Queen, for yeah, example, starts yeah. kind of in the middle of the chorus, right? This is such yeah, an unusual that an arranging. That was an edit, okay? Yeah, that was an edit. Okay. We had, uh, yeah, we, it was too long and we... I don't know who came up with the idea to well, we could start there instead. And that was great. It's brilliant. Yeah. It kind of illustrates how um, the human mind works a bit like AI as well. You know, that we gather all this information in the form of songs when we grow up. And we never, never stop, I think. And we use it as inspiration as as an impulse to do something. I can say that Dancing Queen was inspired by um, a big hit um, in the US called Rock Your Baby. Mm -hmm. So when you hear Dancing Queen, it has nothing to do with Rock Your Baby. Right. But the groove, uh, that slow kind of disco groove, right. was something that, oh, that, that's, that's interesting. I, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I think that's how pop music evolves. Absolutely. Yeah. If you take a track like that, when you, st when you would start recording a track, so you have the song structure and everything, and you start layering things, because your, your records are so beautifully produced. How long would it take for you to, figure, to, to decide that you had the right groove for the song, the right tempo? Would, these thing, would, you, would you try it a bunch of times? Yeah, and... but we had musicians in the studio. Yeah. We had another guitar player and, and a bass, and 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 uh, drums. Yep. The five of us would sit in the studio. I would write a demo lyric, mm -hmm. uh, and Benny and I would play the song. And gradually, the guys would, you know, come in, and we'd be doing that until we felt, well, this might be something. Okay. We would stop, you know, say to the bass player, "Oh, remember that? That's that's great," and he was. And they were so disciplined, so that then he'd stick to that okay. <laughs> for for that part of the song. Right, and that's how we would work. And uh, eventually, I would get out and get up here into the studio, mm -hmm. and it would continue until we had a basic backing track. And with would that typically piano, be one one day? Or so, and, yeah, and, yeah, one and what would be the backing track? Would it be piano, bass, drums, and a, one guitar part, something yeah, like yeah. that? Yeah, one, one guitar, bass, drums, and, and a piano or, or a synth of, of some kind later. We would have that basic backing track, and then Benny would do overdubs once the synths came into our world. I right. Mean, there was, you know, so many possibilities. And, and, uh, and once we had, we felt this is what this song is about. That's when I would write the lyric. Not until then. 
because I had done, and I had regretted it because he was always wrong. Because the, 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 the song would change its atmosphere, its genre sometimes, and, and altogether. So. Because of the, the actual sound of the track, right? Yeah, it yeah, would have yeah. a certain yes. vibe to it that, that yeah. would suggest a mood for the lyric. Yeah, not only a mood, it would conjure up like images sometimes in me when I was, I would play it back, you know, again and again. Because I trusted in the fact that it would tell me what it's about, either in the form of a line, a hook, or in the form of something happening, like in Knowing Me, Knowing You, I, I could clearly see a man in this case walking from room to room with boxes all packed up, empty rooms and what was going through his mind at that moment, like, like a, almost cinematic. R writing a lyric is uh, something in between a poem and, and um, a melody. Right. Because a, a lyric should, a pop lyric should have, you know, the percussive qualities that the melody and the track demands. Explain Sound, that a little right? more. So for instance, take a chance on me. Yeah comes from because wow. it sounded like that so when you're sitting there with your notepad or whatever writing your lyrics you're yeah. thinking about these things oh, only, only afterwards only when I played the track back with yeah. a, uh, with a overdubs on it would you sit typically in the studio and do that or would you take uh, home I, I would sit at home what would be a short time to write a lyric versus a long time some some songs I wrote several. I think Chiquitita, we tried uh, two, two other lyrics because the ladies would come into the studio and sing and it wouldn't sound right. Okay. And then it was a matter of going back to the drawing board. Would it not sound right because just he hearing them sing it and you're like, it doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, in intuitively, not knowing exactly why, but right. no, this isn't right. <laughs> It doesn't feel right. And th that's where I think an AI cannot, you know, right. compete. This AI, this company that played you these, this new new AI, wh what, what do we call this? They refer to AI models. Models. Yeah. And there will be many such models out there. I think they're quite expensive to build. Okay. The, the, a really good ones. So there might not be so many to start with. What is in it for the companies like Spotify and Apple Music, do the labels say, we're not gonna let you use any of our music. We're gonna create our own streaming platforms where we put all of our own artists out and we're gonna use our own AI. This seems like this is a whole nother problem. Yes, it is. And, and one huge problem is the number of songs being uploaded. And you can imagine with AI as well, uh, the DSPs have to put some kind of filter or the aggregators through which the songs flow in, or, and, and, and the labels. Right. They have to put some filters in there. We can't have AI songs, millions of them, dilute That's right. um, the royalties for the real artists and the real songwriters. I haven't spoken to any representatives of DSPs yet about that, but I imagine they're thinking about it because for one thing, the storage costs right. so much money. Yes. And the energy that's being wasted on all this, forgive me, but bullshit being uploaded. Yeah. And the other problem is how will we remunerate the creators of the music that it's trained on. When you have so much music out there, people now rely on algorithms to suggest things. Yeah. What keeps a Spotify from pushing their own AI artists over actual real artists? The uh, music industry right now are talking about artist-centric, user-centric subscription model. Okay. That could be one solution that um, you, you actually only pay the artist who you're playing. Mm -hmm. So then the unplayed AI is not being paid by, because 
no one who subscribes wants to listen to it. Right. As, as easy as that. Right. I, I've been talking about user centric for a long time, and I think it's 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 one thing that has to be really seriously considered now, uh, with AI coming in. Who we makes these decisions, though? Ultimately. Uh, ultimately, the big uh, bosses in the music industry. Uh, and and uh, there I talk about the labels, the publishers, the DSPs, all of them. Are they nervous or are they excited about this, about, about this technology? Both. Okay. What I hear, they're both nervous and excited. And it depends on who you talk to, of course. Some people only see the negative side. Well, I personally believe that you're, the average listener out there will accept AI music if it's good. Hmm. They don't care if it's not good. No, not created no, by humans. No, no. I, I agree with you. From what I've heard so far, I, I could potentially think that I'm, I'm listening to either a radio station or I happen to stream something which I think, oh, wonderful, this is great. And it could be AI. Right. That's going to happen. I, I think great music is created from the human experience. It, deep emotions, and all that stuff AI can't handle. Right. AI can just, you know, guess what comes next. The, the fan bases will be much more important, and people will want to feel closeness to the artist that they, that they love. I mean, I'm an avatar myself, mm -hmm. but I, I doubt You're that, an avatar. I doubt that that avatars, that people will be okay with avatars. I want to ask you about this. When mm -hmm. you created your av avatars, yeah. okay, the actual, uh, what do you call it, motion capture or something, when yeah. you, they put the sensors on and yeah, yeah. they put them all over your body, right? And you were... Yeah, we were dressed in some kind of black leotards. Okay. With uh, little bulbs on them. Okay. And, and helmets and, and dots in our faces. <laughs> And to make it easier for the cameras and the computers to register how we moved around. Okay, and you were actually singing to your, you were basically playing and lip syncing yes. to your own tracks, we, right? We, we were doing exactly the same thing we did in front of TV cameras in the, in the 70s. Exactly the same thing, only this time for 70 year olds, you know, looking ridiculous. Could you ever have imagined that? No, of course not. <laughs> I thought it was the end of it in the 80s. They might play the odd song, but otherwise ABBA would be forgotten. ABBA has so many young fans. My kids, mm -hmm. I have, my kids are 16, 14, and 10. They know your music. Why has your music lasted for so long? Yeah, I, I really honestly don't know. And I'm okay with that. Right. <laughs> but but uh, as soon as people start trying to explain... It Fe feels good though, doesn't it? It, it feels really good. Yeah. Yes. E every day I'm reminded of it. Someone comes up to me and you can see in their face, now I'm going to tell him something that he hasn't heard before. <laughs> Thank you for the music. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so sweet. But you don't need to know why, exactly why. You just have to accept it. I, I listen to some of the songs back to back with something new. Mm -hmm. It still sounds fresh. It, it doesn't sound... Some of them sound dated, yes, but, but a lot of them don't. When you guys would track, uh, track your vocals, mm -hmm. how would you delineate who was going to sing what? Was there an have a sound that you would always go for with the with the vocals well you just had to hear the two ladies yeah. and that was the abba sound there's some unique quality uh when they sing together they're blend yeah, they blend and uh, especially when when frida she's a mezzo mm -hmm. and she strives to get up there with agneta is a soprano yeah. There's a kind of metal in the sound that is distinct and you can hear it miles away. Do you think it's because she's in that her upper part of her range and there's a certain harmonic thing that happens yeah, between the two? Something happens between the two. And and as far as who sings what, it, it was a matter of, you know, this uh, 
album. Oh, Agneta already has three. It's my turn. So you would literally so do was, stuff like that. It's right? more like that. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is fair. Kind of like you would expect. Yeah, yeah. Did they ever say, why didn't you give me that song? Not that I can remember. Interesting. It might have been, you know, that we might have played three or four songs to them. And one of them would have said, oh, that's mine. Bjorn, I want to come back to something about the AI-trained voice mm -hmm. that, that uh, has been appearing on uh, YouTube is one of the places in TikTok. Mm -hmm. There was AI Drake song mm, and yeah. um, who owns that Drake voice? That, that's a very interesting question. We, uh, one that we've been thinking about, you know, being avatars and all of that. Yeah. Name and likeness is an important thing. Yeah. Can you copyright yourself or trademark yourself? I think you must be able to. The label owns the sound recording, but I own my voice. Right. And where is the distinction? If, if uh, someone imitates Elvis, right, you can't take that down. No. If an AI trains on your voice, it's an imitation, isn't it? It is. <laughs> so legally, how will you be able to take down John Lennon singing something else? Uh, it's going to be very problematic. Some people would say, well, this is obviously fair use. This is an original creation. Yeah, yeah. So far... We, ABBA has many tribute bands. Right. And I see that as a tribute. I, I see that as fantastic that people even want to imitate. Have you been out to see an actual ABBA no, tribute? No, I haven't. I haven't. Uh, no, that's, that's, uh, that's no, a little, that's a that. bridge too far. <laughs> that's a bridge too far. But I, I you know, that's, uh, that's an homage to, to an artist. So if people want to, hear you sing uh, or solo me or maybe that's a tribute as well to your voice we have to be exposed to it i think before we can say anything right and we ain't seen nothing yet right it is amazing though the speed at which all these things developed mm, in yeah. the last six months really yes i i was a guest editor on radio four in um, between christmas and uh, in 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 the uk mm -hmm. In uh, between Christmas and New Year's Eve, and I, I spoke to a Google guy high up in in the hierarchy, and he he said to me then, AI is going to explode this year, and it did, it did it really did. So tell me about your app that you've been working on. I've I've been interested in in artists and and songwriters' rights mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. You are the president of CSAC. Uh, of, of CSAC, which yeah. is, of course, the umbrella organization for all CMOs, all PRSs, uh, VMIs, ASCAPs around the world. Yep. And I'm, I'm also the proud uh, co-founder of a platform called Session. Mm -hmm. um, and with the core idea to capture the relevant metadata, the relevant identifiers for songwriters during the creative process because that is the secret to get faster and more accurate payments. Talk, and, talk about how songwriters, uh, talk about ways that, that writers and musicians miss out on money that they're deserved. A recording uh, is uploaded to Spotify but um, the metadata about the songwriters isn't on it. Right. The label hasn't included that. Right. And that means that Spotify doesn't know who to pay the money to. And it goes into a black box. And that black box has a lot of money in it. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know what, what, what it's like uh, today, but, but uh, in the old days, it used to be that the black, black box with, you know, within certain periods was distributed to publishers and CMOs and, and labels according to market share. And what happened to it after that, I don't know. Session then includes the metadata. Yeah. Who plays on the tracks? Well, well it's about the, write, the writing of the song. Okay, the writing of the song. Oh, because so, uh, so many songs are co-written today mm -hmm. by 10, 15 people. And, and they need to be uh, included with their um, identifiers, numbers, mm -hmm. for neighboring rights and, and for 
the publishing rights. So uh, everyone ha would have a unique... And the work has a certain code, ISWC, mm -hmm. and, and the writers have their numbers, unique numbers. Which right. would be like a social security number or yeah, what, something yes, like exactly. that. Yes, exactly. That would always be so, their number. Yeah, so that follows the song um, into the recording and everything is there. And once it's uploaded to Spotify, uh, everyone knows where to pay the money. And as far as the songwriter splits are concerned, all that is detailed in this, yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. This prevents things like songs that have the same name. Yeah, because that's what the CMOs uh, have done in the past. They are comparing texts. Right. Uh, and it's so old-fashioned. It and so they old still do. If the right code is there from the word go, it doesn't matter what the song is called. What do you do about music that's already in existence that doesn't have the, the metadata? Should everything be retrofitted with metadata? Yes, it has like to that? be manually. Uh, you know, that, that, that song, well, it must be them. And that must be it. And then they're manually matched. One of the things that f always frustrates me, uh, I, I have... I use both Apple Music and Spotify. The fact that there is such little data on the things, many times the songwriters are missing. Mm. There's nothing about what who the musicians are. There's nothing about the producer in there, typically. No. That idea of, of knowing who are contributing to these yeah. things is such an important part. It is important, and it's so unnecessary that it isn't there. Right. Because if you do it through, if you register, you. Uh, capture it through a tool, a platform like Session, rich metadata would follow the work um, into the studio and, and onwards, and everybody would be on it who is on, the, on that track. And not only that, they might have taken little videos in the studio. Um, that could be included, anything. Wow. And that's what we want, rich metadata when we listen to the music. Absolutely. Clickable, rich metadata. That's Absolutely. what we want. Why are you still interested in this? Do you feel like it's a, a responsibility to, to be there for the songwriters? It's part curiosity uh, and, and wanting to know what's going on and mm -hmm. following what's going on. But it's certainly also to to help if I can, because but it's also um, exciting and interesting. Yeah, and to have a reason to, you know, deep dive into this thing with AI now is yeah. is incredibly exciting. When are artists? Are there other artists that are creating avatars of themselves that you know of, uh, or that maybe you wouldn't talk about, but that have talked to you about this? There must be, of course. There, there have been many artists going to. Uh, Abba Voyage in London. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would imagine that a lot of my peers would be thinking about this right now. Mm -hmm. Mick and Keith and, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you, what have you <laughs> out there. Um, but I have not heard of anyone actually really attempting to do it yet. It took years to do this, right? Yeah, and it's also, there are so many ingredients. It's not just you know, putting life-like avatars on a stage. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a story, there needs to be depth, there needs to be a fan base, uh, and the music catalog needs to be relevant. Yeah. So many things need to be, you know, in place to do it. I've, I've discussed this with our creative team. Who Who is next? Who could be next? And also the fact that all four of us were alive and condone it, authorized it. Yes. May, gives it cred in a, in a way that's important. It's not speculation in, in someone who's dead. Yeah. Artists that are not living, obviously. I, I read that Paul McCartney was putting together a Beatles song from a John Lennon demo or something mm -hmm. like that, and they're gonna use an AI trained John Lennon. I, but what I understand from that is that there is a demo of John Lennon singing. Yeah, yeah, singing that song. Yes. And and it's just that the sound quality is bad. Yeah. But with the help of AI, you can extract that voice from the bad surrounding and isolate it and, and enhance it. But it is John Lennon. To me, that could be a good use of this for yeah. artists yeah. That, that are not 
mm. with us anymore. Yeah. I think that there's there's a lot of positives here. I think a lot of people immediately go for the negative, but I, I've always been a, well, let's wait and see what happens with it. If you hear one of your songs playing somewhere, you're wa walking down the street, you hear it, will you listen? Do you think about it? Or do you just go on? I, I'm still kind of humbled by it. The fact that it's happening and, it, and you know, I've, I've been traveling a bit lately, Singapore, Seoul, Tokyo, and various places, and it's the same everywhere, which is very, very humbling. How I ask myself every time, how did this happen? But when I hear it on, sometimes in my, in my car, when maybe I listen to a radio station and they play something. I, I listen. Are you transported though when you listen? Are you transported back to the time or do you just kind of take the whole thing in? Do you, re I, do you I, remember I, being there creating these no, things? No, no, sadly I don't. Okay. I would say that the, the 70s for us was such a, a creative explosion that, mm -hmm. that we have very, I have very few memories mm -hmm. with, you know, individual songs. They, because we would write three, four, we would go into the studio, we would record them and mix them, and then we'd be on to the next ones. And they would be released and we would get the charts, reports, but we would be on to the next one. When you're tracking the vocals in the studio, if you've just written the song, do you read lyrics? Would the girls be reading lyrics off lyric sheets? They'd come in in the morning and and I'd I'd give them copies of and and we'd sing it together like in this situation here. Yeah, exactly this. Yeah, that's how we'd start the day, and this is exactly how we started forty years later, when we when you got back unexpectedly together unexpectedly got back together and recorded. Um, a new album, but that that was so familiar and so strange because we were, you know. Did it feel just like it did? Was uh, it after, just so familiar? Yeah, after, after a few seconds, right? It was weird but familiar. I gave them the lyrics, <laughs> and, they were, and we would go through, and they would make you know notes, and and uh, that's amazing. and then they they'd walk out into the studio and and stand in front of the mics and, and exactly the yeah. same. Bjorn, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, sit here it's with me. It's really been a pleasure. Such an honor to meet you in person. Wow, um, can't even believe it. Thank you. That's all for now. Remember my channel is self-funded with no outside advertisers. So if you want to see more content like this, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club and hit the subscribe button now. Thanks so much for watching.